Australia is planning a travel bubble with Singapore with details to be released within the next week. We'll hear from two students who have been stuck since borders shut, one in Australia and the other in Singapore. And airlines are getting planes ready for service with flights resuming in time for the year-end holidays. Good evening, you're watching The Big Story. I'm Harian Tudiman. You can subscribe to the Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. A further easing of restrictions for vaccinated migrant workers. Now from next Saturday, October 30th, up to 3,000 migrant workers will be able to visit Little India and Gelang Sarai every week for up to 8 hours each time. This comes after last month's pilot where up to 700 vaccinated residents from 30 dorms visited Little India for 6 hours after taking antigen rapid test before and after the visit. Also from October 30th, the program will expand to include recreation centre visits for up to three times a week with no need to undergo a pre-visit ART. Restrictions easing for cruise passengers as well from November 8th. Those on Royal Caribbean's Quantum of the Seas will no longer need to take a PCR test before boarding. An ART will be administered instead at the cruise terminal on the day of departure. This though is only in place until the end of November. From December 2nd, Quantum of the Seas guests will take the ERT on the departure day, but at Raffles City Convention Centre before they head to the cruise terminal. Prime Minister Lee Sen Lung says he's delighted to hear that Australia will be allowing entry to visa holders from Singapore. His counterpart, Scott Morrison, earlier announcing that both countries are in the final stages of concluding a quarantine-free travel bubble that could be established within the next week. The initial plan, according to the Sydney Morning Herald newspaper, is to allow vaccinated students and business travellers to fly between Singapore and Australia before it opens up to tourists. The arrangement would also de depend on the quarantine restrictions of Australia's individual states. It's been 19 months since Australia shut its international borders and has been allowed only limited travels from overseas. Um, we are in the final stages of concluding an arrangement with the Singapore government. Um, I was in a position, as you know, some months ago when I met with the Prime Minister of Singapore, Prime Minister Lee in Singapore, uh, to set up a new arrangement which will see our borders open more, uh, more quickly to Singapore. Um, we anticipate that being uh, able to be achieved uh, within the next week or so, um, as we would open up to more visa class holders coming out of Singapore, um, we will see that occur uh, to those ports here in Australia uh, that will be open in the same way as they are here in Sydney. Uh, and we would expect to see that align pretty much with the uh, timetable that Qantas has announced today regarding when they'll have flights going to Singapore. Expressing his delight in a Facebook post, PM Lee also had this to say, Singapore and Australia have robust economic and investment links and warm people-to-people -people ties. Look forward to resuming close connectivity between our countries as we move towards an endemic COVID future. With vaccinated students, one of the first groups to benefit from this bubble, how do they feel about today's news? Well, joining me is Clarissa Lowe. She's a second-year student at the University of Melbourne, but has been in Singapore since April 2020. Also with us is Heather Gunn, who is in a PhD program at the University of Wollongong, about 80 kilometres from Sydney. Let's first get your reaction to the announcement. Heather, why don't you start? Yeah, well, I was pretty excited to hear this new bubble opening. I am still a bit skeptical of it, though, because it there's been so much talk of it happening multiple times since lockdown. Um, and perhaps, you know, hopefully that this is the time where it actually comes to fruition. So I was actually quite excited because I haven't been home for approximately 21 months and really keen to come back and visit everyone again. Hmm. Clarissa, what about you? You're in your second year right now. Are you hopeful that uh, with this likely travel bubble, you'll be, be able to return to Melbourne for your third year? Yes, definitely. Um, I've done almost half of my degree online and I believe that there are many students like myself who have either spent a really short time on campus before returning back home or have never stepped foot onto campus before. And for the last year and a half, 
I've been constantly, you know, keeping myself up to date with the news, you know, trying to look for any signs or possibilities that international students might be able to return to campus. And so far, there hasn't been any concrete plans or good news until today, you know, with Australia making really big strides in bringing their vaccination rates up, I am hopeful that this might finally be our chance to return to campus to experience the proper student life. And Clarissa, I understand as well that uh, you're shul shouldering quite a responsibility. You're the president of the Singapore Students Society at the University of Melbourne. How have you kept your members' uh, spirits up? Right, no doubt the last year and a half you know, has been very demoralising for many of us students who are stuck here, you know, as we feel like we are missing out on a lot. Um, however, it's precisely during trying times like this where my society can really come in and make a difference in improving the university experience of our members. You know, we try to come up um, with social events that are either online or in person to bring Singaporeans together. Mm. And there is something you know, to offer to everyone, regardless of whether our members are in first year or third year, or whether they are in Singapore or in Melbourne doing remote learning. And, you know, there is just something very comforting about knowing that you're not facing this alone and that there is a community out there who's able to support you throughout this confusing time. You know, after hearing today's news on a possible travel bubble with Australia, you know, we are definitely feeling very hopeful then, and we would love to be able to assist our members, you know, in their return back to Melbourne, you know, with possible information sessions or perhaps alumni sharing in the near future. Heather, now over in Australia, you mentioned earlier on that you've been stuck in Australia for 21 months now. Tell us more, you know, what have you gone through uh, throughout this whole period? How have you coped financially and emotionally? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, with, with COVID being a pandemic, there's so much uncertainty um, with everything. And so I think initially in Australia, it wasn't as strict as in Singapore. We didn't really have to wear masks when we were outside. Um, and it came a time where the greater Sydney region just experienced an influx of COVID cases. So we became um, going into really strict lockdown and we just got out of lockdown about two weeks ago. So for four months, we weren't allowed out at all except for essential um, services or to see the doctor. Um, so I guess during that period, there's been a huge variation in what I've managed to do because initially we did get a lot of freedom. Life still proceeded pretty much as normal. I could travel interstate, um, see my friends. But during the lockdown, we weren't able to do any of that. So it's been a lot of, you know, trying to exercise at home, trying to meal prep, occupying our time. Um, it's also been a bit difficult in the sense that we didn't have an end date to the lockdown. It was initially meant to be a month, then it got extended another month and then two more months. So I think everyone's spirits were quite low during that period of time. Um, in regards to coping, I was quite all right financially because I am on a stipend scholarship. So that has um, been really helpful. And I also got a job during the lockdown period so that um, in the financial aspect, I wasn't really struggling, which was really lucky for me. Um, and I guess emotionally, it was quite tough with all the very sudden changes and restrictions imposed on us. Um, I think that everyone's sort of in a state of languishing where we're kind of distressed, not necessarily flourishing. Um, and that has taken quite a huge toll on many people's mental health. Mm. Heather, fingers crossed, of course, you know, travel bubble happens. What preparations do you need to make in order to return to Singapore? Yeah, um, so I guess concerning preparations, I haven't really thought too much into that, to be honest, because I'm still a bit sceptical until there is a formal release and, you know, we're allowed to book our air tickets and come back home. I'm still in the state where perhaps I don't really want to make too many preparations. Um, but work-wise, because I do have a job here and I am considered an essential worker, um, perhaps talking to my management about the possibility of taking leave. They are all quite supportive because they know I haven't been home for a really long time. So they have said that, you know, they will grant leave if the bubble opens and I need to return back to Singapore. Heather, Clarissa, thank you so much for setting aside time to come onto the show to speak with us. All the best to the both of you. 
A much more lively Melbourne awaits Clarissa when she goes back. The world's most locked down city finally emerging from 262 days or nearly nine months of restrictions during six separate lockdowns since March 2020. Under the new rules, restaurants and cafes can reopen with up to 20 people indoors and 50 outdoors, all of whom must be vaccinated. Qantas planes getting cleaned as more flights are being added for the year-end holiday rush. The carrier will start its first commercial flights between Australia and India in almost a decade before Christmas. And flights to Singapore, Bangkok and Fiji will resume ahead of schedule. Also in line with Australia's reopening, Singapore Airlines will be expanding its passenger capacity with Sydney, with the Airbus A380 Jumbo Jet returning to the Australian city on December 1st. SIA says that the move underlines its unwavering commitment to the Australian market. Meanwhile, Thailand will allow vaccinated visitors from 46 countries to enter quarantine-free from November 1st. And this will include Singapore, Australia, China, Britain and the US. Bangkok and other popular tourist spots like Hua Yin and Pattaya will be open. And to skip the quarantine, visitors must arrive by plane, be fully vaccinated and produce a document to show they're virus-free. In other headlines, investigations are underway after actor Alec Baldwin fired a prop gun on the set of his new movie Rust, killing the film's director of photography Helena Hutchins, while his director Joel Souza was injured and taken to the hospital. A spokesperson for Baldwin said the incident involved the misfiring of a prop gun with blanks. Production of the film has been halted. Back home, the iconic Golden Mile complex has been gazetted as a conserved building. Stressing that the decision was not taken lightly, National Development Minister Desmond Lee also said that conservation will not undermine the owner's collective sale efforts as the Urban Redevelopment Authority will offer incentives to potential buyers. We recognise that some owners may see conservation as a constraint as the building is ageing, and the owners have been planning for a collective sale. Some owners shared that they were looking to use the proceeds for their retirement. Now to address these concerns, URA has made the effort to ensure that conservation does not undermine the owners' collective sale efforts. Last year, URA proposed to conserve the building, accompanied by a significant incentive package to make development options for the site more attractive to potential buyers the developer will be able to build a new tower block about 30 storeys high beside the main building. The site boundary may also be extended to include part of the adjacent state land for more design flexibility. A tax incentive will also be provided, which will lower development costs. This tax will be fully waived for the conserved floor area and partly waived on the new floor area. There are other incentives on the table the incentive package is unique to Golden Mile Complex as its conservation is the first of its kind, another pioneering endeavour. HDB resale prices hitting a record high in the third quarter, with five-room flats in Queenstown the most expensive at a median price of $926,000. So far this year, resale prices have risen 9.1%, the steepest three-quarter increase in more than a decade. Singapore's private home prices climbing as well 1.1% in the third quarter. Against Q2's 0.8% rise, this faster pace was driven by a sharp increase in landed property prices, which jumped 2.6% in the third quarter. Meanwhile, condo and apartment prices rose at a slower rate, up just 0.7% in the last three months, compared with a 1.1% increase in the second quarter. Singapore is considering using carbon credits to help it reduce its carbon footprint, with the Trade and Industry Ministry telling The Straits Times that carbon credits will complement our efforts in encouraging industrial energy efficiency and adopting emissions reduction measures. Now, to further explain this is science and environment correspondent Audrey Tan. 
Welcome to the show, Audrey. Audrey, what are carbon credits and how will that help Singapore reduce its carbon emissions? Hi, Yan. Okay, so a carbon credit essentially means that if a buyer buys a carbon credit, you can offset your emissions based on emissions reduction that is happening elsewhere. So for instance, in Singapore, if let's say we are emitting um, carbon dioxide uh, emissions from Jurong Island, what Singapore can do is we can buy carbon credits coming from, say, like a forest conservation project in Indonesia. And every ton of carbon, carbon dioxide that that forest sequesters takes in and stores it underground in the soil, we can minus that ton of emissions from our inventory. So that is, in essence, how carbon credits work and how that will help Singapore achieve its climate pledge so it will help in terms of accounting because, I mean, based on the way I described it earlier, um, even though we the emissions are still coming from Singapore on our side, we can buy carbon credits to kind of offset it. But this is just meant to be a complementary strategy to helping um, Singapore uh, reduce, uh, meet its climate, cl climate pledge of reaching net zero emissions by 2050 because the amount of efforts that we can do domestically is limited. So let's say um, most of our emissions now come from burning fossil fuels. Sometimes it's not immediately possible for us to decarbonize our energy grid totally. So in the short term, buying carbon credits will enable us to offset uh, our emissions, um, even as we undertake strategies that would require long, longer term to, to manifest, like you know, deploying, carbon, uh, deploying solar panels, importing renewable energy, uh, and developing and doing research into low carbon technologies. Right. Audrey, separately, I understand you'll be in Glasgow for the UN's Climate Change Conference, uh, COP26. It's a crucial step in setting worldwide targets to slow global warming. However, while 60 nations have pledged that their emissions will reach net zero by a certain time, Singapore hasn't yet indicated that it will be improving its climate pledge. What's the latest there? Yes, uh, so I will be going to Glasgow with David Fogarty, our climate change editor. And yes, as you mentioned, one of the key aims at this year's meeting is to get countries to show greater climate ambition. And by that, uh, we mean set bolder climate targets that will say that, okay, I'm going to reduce my emissions by a lot more. And in the lead up to this year's conference, we have many countries coming forward with net zero targets. So even our closest neighbours have already done so, like Malaysia by 2050, Indonesia and Thailand by I think 2060 and 2070. Singapore... Uh, on the other hand, our net zero pledge is a bit more vague. Uh, we said last year that we will have our emissions reach net zero as soon as viable in the second half of the century. So actually, I'm writing a piece on this which will be published tomorrow. But just to give you a bit of a teaser, Singapore is facing many constraints in terms of decarbonizing it completely. Um, as you, you asked me earlier about what's the, the value of carbon credits in. In the short term, it's very difficult for Singapore to decarbonize completely because we don't have large areas of land to soak up all the sunshine and so on. So we do face constraints that will limit us from like reaching net zero by 2050. But I mean, having been reporting on climate change for a while now, I feel like I do see the writing on the wall. Like even in the past two years alone, we see so many developments that could put Singapore in a better position to make bolder climate pledges going forward. Um, examples include like, we face constraints in terms of decarbonizing our energy, which is now mainly from fossil fuels. But in the past two years or so, we see like uh, more pilots being announced about importing renewable, renewable energy from Malaysia, from, from Laos, from uh, Indonesia. And just earlier this week, we saw that there's a, a subsea cable project connecting a solar farm in Australia to Singapore. And that construction for that will begin by 2023. So if Singapore can import more renewable energy, then that would put us in a better position to decarbonize our energy grid and help us to meet our emissions. So I do think that for now, maybe Singapore is adopting a more cautious approach. Other countries make net zero pledges at the get-go and then years later, they follow up with an action plan. For me, it seems that Singapore is doing the opposite. We are laying out the frameworks, putting all our chicks in a, in, in a row before we come up with the climate pledge. So... I do think that we can expect Singapore to make um, greater and more ambitious targets uh, soon, hopefully in the future. Thank you for your perspectives, Audrey. We'll be checking in again with our science and environment correspondent, Audrey Tan, as COP26 draws nearer. In the meantime, tomorrow's paper will have more on this gathering and of course on Audrey's piece as well. So look out for that.
And for more news and videos, visit straightstimes.com and remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. I'm Harianto Diman. Stay safe and have a great weekend.